you very much, Ian. And thank you, David, and thank you, everybody. I'm so thrilled to be here for the festival. I was absolutely delighted to be have some poems in the magazine, and to be invited to read at the festival was absolutely the icing on the cake. Um, so I'm going to start by reading four poems from my collection of um, prose poems, the book Stalker. Um, it's divided into seven sections. It's set entirely in my teens and twenties, and I spent two years in Paris, um, first when I was 15 and then when I was 17. Um, the book has several threads going through it. Stalker in his many guises, travel, different countries, dreams, literature, twins, I am a twin, memory and fear. And so I'm going to read the first one which is set in Paris and then two from the last section which is set in Gravesend, Kent. Um, and this one, the, the two I'm going to read now are sort of love poems but quite different. This is a first love in Paris and it's uh, the, at the end of that first love and it ends with a quote from Rilke. Dark matters. The aisle rocks with bodies clinging to leather straps. I wipe the steamed up window and gaze down at the glow of a remorqueur moving slowly down river through mist. Someone flicks a golwas to the floor and stubs it with his foot. All eyes switch to where it smoulders between two slats. I watch the barge disappear as if it's taking my life away. And yet, am I not merely unaware of the regions that are beyond us? Rilke says that the Arabs knew how to see the invisible. And if I had the right eyes, wouldn't I too perceive how much greater are the black sectors? And I'm going to jump now to section six, which is death and magic. That section was called Storms and Stations. And this is another love poem. It's a famous doomed love. And I guess here the stalker is possessive love. The world is a swaying lantern. The world is a swaying lantern. And I am a spirit lost in the urban wilderness. A muffled bus glides by, the lucky ones Inside, lit up like spectres staring through peepholes in the whited out windows. Cars have been abandoned. Road markings and boundaries have vanished. I have relinquished my bed, dreams and reading, but cannot get to teach. If only a Drosky or Troika would enter the scene. There are no announcements at the station. All is still, silent, gagged. Who is the fig figure edging beside the train, tapping the undercarriage with a metal pole, the bell sound ringing out in the petrified silence? Who is the cloaked woman pacing the platform near the engine, trembling and distraught? And I'm going to read two from the um, title sequence. The last two sections are set in Gravesend, and I don't hold it against Gravesend what I'm going to read. Um, <laughs> funnily enough, reviewers, just about all the reviewers who, who looked at this book thought the whole thing was metaphorical. Now, there's, there's lots of metaphor, but everything that happens in Stalker actually did happen, including in the title sequence. And this refers to, it's a sequence of eight poems, and it refers to a time I was teaching in Gravesend, and for two terms, either side of the long vacation, I had a stalker. And at first I saw him, and when I tried to, outside, and when I tried to um, take measures so that he couldn't look in, it turned really nasty and sinister. And he became an invisible stalker and was shooting through my window, my bedroom window, with an air rifle. So um, this next poem, I mean, believe it or not, even in those circumstances, I did at times, I would hide under a table because it would always be predictable. I knew when it was going to happen. And it only happened if I was there by myself. It never happened if I was away. So it was very spooky knowing that I was being watched and yet I couldn't see anybody. But I couldn't help nevertheless sometimes seeing the comical side of it as well. <laughs> Company. These days I party every evening. Wine courtesy of Monsieur Le Patron and generous supplies of Winston's. 
It's not your regular type of party with mu music and dancing. In fact, you might say it's somewhat singular. You'll think it funny, and I too laugh from time to time. At first I called it my reading party. I invited Rilke, but he didn't empathise and I didn't engage. Even Steinbeck lost his touch, so I busied myself instead. My reading parties became sewing parties. It's cramped under the table, but I can just squeeze in my batik skirt. I think it's the hem's endlessness that gives me the shakes. By half past eight, Monsieur and Winston are depleted, and I'm trembling from head to toe. Before the clock tower strikes nine, I will hear the smash of my splintering window. And then I'm going to end this from Stalker. Um, on the, it's not the final poem. It's called Compulsion. And it refers to this absolute compulsion. I had to see my face to go to a mirror because I felt so weird. My, I, you know, it's all the blood drained away, I suppose. And it occurred to me that's what turns stalkers on, seeing the fear. Um, the poem also refers to a painting by Robert Wyman called Twin, which is completely in white. And it also refers to my feeling then that it's sort of superstition, maybe fairy tale, that if I broke the window, the mirror, if I broke the mirror, the stalker would get in. So this is called The Compulsion. The Compulsion, to emerge from my hideout and stagger to the mirror, to face the stranger in my face. Who is she in the white of her face? like the white of Robert Wyman's twin. Is it this white that fills the stalker's dreams and fuels his nightly propulsion to the one-way mirror? The reflection is distorted. If I break the mirror, I'm done for. I didn't break the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> right. Shaky, I've had too much caffeine this morning. <laughs> Um, I'd li like to read um, some prose poems from my second collection in progress, which is quite different. It's based on eight characters um, named after their professions or occupations. So there's a scientist, there's an entrepreneur, there's a sheikh, um, there's, um, who else is there? There's an architect, uh, a scientist, I think I've said that. Anyway, several different characters. Um, and it's very different with these ones because rather than being based on memory, they're dealing with what's happening to me around na now, or rather other people. Um, and I try to incorporate myth or medieval into them. And the three I'm going to read here, although they're not meant to be read in sequence necessarily, they all refer to the architect. And the poem tries to blend the architect's creative life with the myth of Ariadne, as a metaphor for the wife who left him after 16 years and moved in with his best friend. Orthogonals and transversals. The architect is working on a painting overlooking the town, which he started during his annual painting trip to France. He's enraptured by the pink brick of Albi Cathedral, blazing like a rose in the midi sun. He sighs, twiddles his chubby fingers and sips his pint of Adnams. Today has not gone well. Years enslaved by perspective and a prodigious memory. His theseus in a labyrinth of orthogonals and transversals, whose Ariadne, whose Ariadne has snapped the thread of the ball she is spinning. I suggest a trip to the blue ball at Granchester. Shifting his pint, he spreads the photos of his paintings. It's a tour of aqueducts and amphitheatres, rock faces, and gorgeous castles and cathedrals. I search for his faithless Ariadne, willing her to emerge from a glint of river, a spiral cloud, a flash of red hibiscus. I ask about the recent commission. Finished, he says cheerfully, the Royal Scot steaming on platform two, the commissioner's father, Tam O'Shanter and Hackle, copped at a jaunty angle, Royal Scots Fusiliers, 1st Battalion. And I know that everything is to scale meticulous and flawless. My poems are not terribly full of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> in this next one, um, in the myth and in the architect's reality, Ariadne has died. Black tie and jacket. The architect is wearing a black tie and jacket. Ariadne is sleeping her final sleep. 
but he did not abandon her. Oh, he never would have abandoned her. Those years ago, when she cut the thread and left him to his demons in the labyrinth, how he still watched out for her. Now we are gathered round him in a post-wake alert. He chooses Moule, followed by Cocovin, and like a weather vane, the conversation changes to the Middle East. And this last one of the architect, um, it refers to a painting which had a, a, a boat in it, and it reminded me of my childhood because my dad had a wherry at um, Beckles. Um, but there was an extraordinary p experience for me with this painting because he'd been, you know, I'd been using the Ariadne myth, and when I saw this painting, the boat was called Ariadne, and I just couldn't believe it. And I asked if that was because the boat actually was called Ariadne, and he said, no, it didn't have a name. So why did he paint Ariadne? The reason, he was listening to Richard Strauss's Ariadne, Alf <coughs> Naxos. Glockenspiel and symbols. <clears throat> when the architect shows me his painting of Beckles, I search for a wherry with its horses and sails. Here's the church, and the town, and the river Bure. Then I see it a little skiff with Ariadne daubed in red across the bow. But the boat was nameless when he sketched it in situ. So he gets home, and perhaps it's Zerbinetta messing with his colours and brushes as he dabs on Ariadne to the sound of glockenspiel and cymbals. Then the river nymphs arrive with their violins and cellos, and he pours himself a glass of wine. He sits a while to contemplate the reflections on the river, and questions of twilight, whether to add her constellation to the sky. Not so much concepts as echoes, and without even thinking, Alf Naxos, Os, Os. And I'm going to finish with four poems from, it's going to be part of the collection, um, but it's quite different. They, I've put some leaflets on the back table about the Scott Polar, exhibition in Cambridge at the uh, Scott Polar um, Research Institute. Um, and the brief for eight, he's holding it up, John's holding it up for you, you can just take those. It's on until December, but myself and seven other poets were um, um, commissioned to write a poem inspired by an object um, on the permanent display collection. My problem was putting my current work on hold and sort of focusing on that. And then I suddenly realised that one of my characters was a diarist. And I also realised that um, her father's expedition um, set off at the same time as Scott's to the Antarctica. So there's the British Antarctic Expedition, 1910 to 1913. There's the diarist father's expedition to British New Guinea, 1910 to 1912. And so I saw that I could maybe link the two and bring them in together. Anyway, that's the idea. And the diary's father was also an eminent explorer, of course, as well as a medical doctor, a botanist, an entomologist. Um, and he died a tragic death, but it was nothing to do with the expeditions. Um, so the first poem refers to Pennell, who was the Terra Nova's commander, the ship to Terra Nova, and Pennell is the commander. And the second quote is from the diary's father, um, from his own diaries. So this one's called Pictures and Frames. The diarist is writing a century after the expeditions. She is not eminent, but is resolute, delving deep, excavating through layers of memory and silted up grief. Unlike the men, she has achieved a venerable store of years. She is trying to form a greater picture framing the two explorers in parallel as they set off in the same year, same century. She wants to shift her obsession to theirs, just as Pennell swung the ship for compass adjustment, to absorb herself in their joys and trials until the bitter end, so her pain becomes theirs, and so their acceptance and grace. I ought not to complain, but it is hard to be philosophic, becoming hers might deepen into, no, not closure, into a kind of forgiveness. Letters and Diaries. 
Uh, her father, Diary's father's name is Sandy, and of course Scott, Sandy. Letters and diaries. She will call them Captain S and Dr S, she thinks, making a list, wryly noting the absurdity of her Tesco inventory alongside theirs, as she fixes her stick and bag on the scooter that's like a sledge without huskies, thinking her cleaner will carry in the goods like a Sherpa. She too has a team, daughters and sons and grandchildren, a nurse bandaging the ulcerous leg in the comfort of... Oh, to think of the frostbite in that tent. To contemplate the swamps, the malaria and beriberi. But where to start? How to sort and sift and record? She must reread the diaries and letters, make lists, keep a journal of scraps and fragments, piecemeal as her strength and sight allow, positioning the magnifying glass to bring it all closer, within reach, amplifying the past in small stages. Um, this next one called Glaciers and Robins, um, it has a, an epigraph from Apsley Cherry Garrard, who was one of the Scott Polar um, team to the Antarctica, but he was one of the survivors. He was also one of the youngest, and because he survived, he was able to write his own diary, the famous, um, the worst journey in the world. So there's a quote, um, not a quote from, yeah, there's an epigraph. And the poem also has... Um, the diarist writing about her image, about her response to this image of the glacier. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. <coughs> Glaciers and Robins. Dante was right when he placed the circles of ice below the circles of fire. Absolutely, Cherry Garrard. The terrifying cliffs, the terrifying ice cliffs are always changing, writes the diarist constantly repelling and attracting. How did they survive the long winter? Did they quarrel? Yes, sir. Damn you, sir. This morning, sitting outside on her scooter, she'd begun to pull ivy from the primroses when the robin arrived like a spirit into her tiny world, so close she could see its black eye. She glances at the image. I hate the way we seem so small in the menacing vastness pulled down to unspeakable depths. Those who'd returned like young Cherry Garrard were never the same. Yes, and then suddenly her scooter had shifted, tilted, and was rolling down the bank towards the stream. And there she was, inches from the water, ridiculous, grappling for her phone as the image of poor Cherry flashed into her mind, swimming in his arms above the dark void. This one, <coughs> Ice and Tears, and this is the last one. Um, and I've got them so that they have little glosses on the sides, either the diarist notes or whatever, or page numbers. So one is the last letters, and the other is my father Sandy, which is actually the diarist brother who wrote a book about the father. So there are two quotes from Scott, and they come from the last letters, which is a collection of the last letters of the five men who died, and the poem refers to the doctor's father, Dr. S, and his tragic death. Ice and Tears. <clears throat> Here is a man who knows he is going to die. The boy will be your comfort. I had looked forward to helping you to bring him up, but it is a satisfaction to feel that he is safe with you. And the diarist flicks to his photograph, envisaging the bitten lips those final moments in the stricken tent with his two surviving companions. Dr. S, on the other hand, snatched away in a collision between a psychotic, noun recorded 1910, and a Cambridge fellow, opening his door to disorder, triggering the end. She leans over the magnifying glass, moved almost to tears by the sloping letters she can barely discern, needing the typescript to read, I wasn't a very good husband, but I hope I will be a good memory. Certainly, the end is nothing for you to be ashamed of. Thank you very much. Thank you.